you're listening to the Neil Lamps Show. My name's Joey, and I'm joined by Paul. Evening, buddy. And Neil. Hello, friends. Yeah, another week where we've got to be talking about pitch invasions. Bastards! <laughs> Legal! <laughs> oh, Joey, as much as I love, and I know other people love your theme tune, but if this week's theme tune isn't just someone going, Wembley! Wembley! <laughs> for about 15 minutes, then you've barely let us all down. Um, I might clip you singing it there out and then just, and then just <laughs> yes, loop please. it for 15 minutes ahead of, uh, and then, yeah, people, when they actually start listening to the podcast, will understand what the hell's going on. Um, I mean, it's really, really good, isn't it? Yeah, I think, how can you not be pleased about it? There's been, there's just a few people around still grumbling and stuff, but my take on it is I'd rather be happy for a little bit. I know everything else is going on and we can focus on the league for a bit, but getting to Wembley so, and you know, going to watch Coventry City at Wembley, we can all have a nice day, all go and feel proud about the club. Let's do it. Yeah, I just think I, 30 years since our last trip and exactly. it's, we, so I know this season has just been a massive steaming turd, but <laughs> that you can kind of disassociate that the rest of the season, and effectively, it's just this one day now, isn't it? It's, but it's just a fabulous opportunity for everyone to get together and to have a nice day out and go and watch us play at Wembley and just have something fun and joyous for a little while. Paul, I take it you're happy? Oh, God, I mean, um, I, uh, I've got three moments of the week, and none of them, amazingly, come from the Millwall game, which I know will come as a shock to everyone who enjoyed that sh- shower shit. But um, it was, A, Kyle Reid's pass for George Thomas, his goal, considering how shit Kyle Reid was during the rest of his game, that pass was a bit, of, bit of skill. And then George Thomas to take that down and, and rifle it in was so pleasing for George. I mean, sort of, I know me and Neil have discussed George quite a lot recently, but I think that was just what he needed. And I think that was a fantastic finish. The second one was actually celebrating goals because they actually meant something. Yeah. For the first time in a long time, just people going ballistic because we'd scored goals. And obviously the final thing is I can go to Wembley with sort of, we're talking about taking my daughter, which is a bit scary because she's never seen us win. But I can go to Wembley <laughs> with my mum, which is quite cool, which I didn't think was going to happen. Oh. So, um, well, you know. So, um, so, yeah, so those are my three moments of the week in, in descending order or ascending order. That's lovely. Neil, have you got any plans for what you're going to do, how you, you're going to go with, etc.? Family? It's the very... Allison clan is all on the way. They're all, everybody, including my mum, she's coming down as well. OK. They're, they're ever so keen. I haven't got a clue what I'll be doing yet. I'm the only one who doesn't know. But um, it's, I've got too many friends, you see, Joey. So there's, um, <laughs> too many plans. But um, no, I, I can't wait. I'll be, I'll, make, I'll be making the weekend of it, I'm pretty sure of it. It's just re- it's just the whole thing of it now. The opportunity that we've got this it's it's nice because there's a little bit of leading time. We've got plans to make, and the, yeah. the, you know what I mean. It's just the the option. And they're set in stone. There's yeah, this, yeah. Oh, well, I've got, I might not book holiday just in case we make the playoffs. We are there. Oh, it's this all done. Stone, yeah. We're going to be there unless yeah, we you know get banned from it for invading <laughs> the pitch a few more times. So that'll be our look. But. Um, um, yeah, there might end up being some clause in it that says you have to be, you have to have a certain amount of points in the league. You have to have a certain amount of league goals. Oh, yeah, no. you've, got, you've got to score more league goals than, comp, than uh, cup, cup goals, goals in the yeah. season. Or, you know, you're not allowed to come if you've, you've won less games in the league than you have in the Checker Trade Trophy. Did you see that stat, Neil, that we have in fact scored more goals yeah. in the this year than in the league? Incredible. It's just... Uh, well, you think in, in that one game, we've, we've equaled the amount of league goals we scored this year. Oh, God. I just I, don't think it's uh, always uh, an uh, angle, isn't it? Well, I, I, on Saturday, on Monday morning, I went, into, I went into work early, and my boss, who's an Everton supporter, was there. And he was like, oh, you know, I was like, you know, it was a good game, obviously. He was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so like, you do realise that Lukaku scored as many goals in one game as we've scored in about eight. He was like, you're joking, aren't you? No. No, both <laughs> both teams scored more goals than we've scored this year. All right, yeah, we're we're shit. But today we're not shit. Today we're possibly the worst team that Coventry have ever had. But that team's going to Wembley. Woohoo! Yeah, I mean, how that team is going to Wembley? I guess, I guess what we've done is been the only club in the country 
who has been interested in um, that cup this year, and we've <laughs> managed to get through effectively by default as the only team that took it anywhere remotely seriously. But I don't think it matters. Only I've, recently, though. Do you, I, did we take it seriously early on, do you reckon? Um, I don't know. I was actually saying that we did play quite strong teams, didn't we? Yeah, I think we've been sort. Of, I think we've been doing it, haven't we? But We're I don't mean to be. For the momentum. Yeah, really and, anywhere. I, and I don't mean to be cynical about it. I'm not sort of demeaning it. I just think um, I, it's just. It, I yeah, I just just think it's wicked. Uh, Neil, moment of the week outside of um, going to Wembley. I guess it must have happened sort of. About five minutes after I got home, yeah, last night I was dri- I drove home. I had um, shooting to win on the um, <laughs> on, on the in the car radio, and um, I got home and I looked at um, Facebook and up popped um, some selfies with uh, Jody Jones, who was um, queuing up outside to get into Smack in Leamington, which is the student night. I thought oh, that's the spirit. Yeah, you've just uh... so it taken me as long to get home as it had taken him to get his glad rags on, splash a brute, <laughs> not to um, off the lem. <laughs> He, oh, he knows wow. the score, doesn't he? Yeah, fair play. Well, I think, um, yeah, why not? I'm, I quite like the idea that they'd go out to celebrate, although it's entirely I hear rumours that... it was him, uh, Kean Harris and Jordan Willis, and they didn't get in. <laughs> apparently um, <laughs> saying that I played for Cov isn't as much of a draw as it used to be. Wow, apparently so, yeah. Um, okay, good stuff. Um, I So, curiously, I double booked because we... So, I'd got tickets to go and see Teenage Fan Club last night, and so they clashed with the game. So, I was not only not at the game, I couldn't even watch it on Sky. And there mm. was a moment where we came out, where we got out, and the, the show was fabulous, and it started to snow, and then I checked on my phone, and just was absolutely incredulous that we had got... <laughs> I, just didn't, I just didn't give us an absolute... I didn't give us a cat and mouse chance. I'd give it loads on Twitter saying, yeah, we're definitely going to get through just because I thought it was funny. But I just didn't think for a second that we'd get through that tie. And I guess we're going to come on to it in a second. But yeah, it was a beautiful moment. Just sort of, yeah, it was just a really, really nice evening. And then, you know, the snow coming down. and then Snow falling. Out. You live yeah, it. It's oh, really... fantastic. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fabulous. Um, then, OK, great. So uh, we're going to do a little bit. Paul's going to do a little bit of Millwall chat and then we'll hit, hit the game itself. So, Paul, Millwall... Well, it's really hard to come down from the ecstatic position I'm in at the moment to discuss what was a truly abomination of a performance against Millwall. And it's, um, yeah, it's quite strange to sort of think back for three days to when I was bemoaning how shit we were and being slightly frustrated with the fact that that was what, 13th league game without a victory and 11 of those we've lost. And, it, I mean, Millwall... And people keep saying this on the radio, and it is true, I don't know if we've said it as well, and it is true, Millwall weren't much cop. But you don't have to be very good if you're a League One side to beat us. All you've got to do is take one of the three or four guilt edge chances we'll give you and not give us any... Well, basically not making any defense mistakes at the back. So, Millwall basically did that. I mean, their first goal comes from a corner that a bit, you know, no one was sure if it was a corner. And then there was the protest, whether or not that, you know, I'm not going over that old ground again. But I do have this particular wish that if you're going to protest, I don't mind protests, I'm all for protests. But can we wait? If we're going to lose anyway, wait till we are losing to protest. Because it's one of those things. Maybe the protest didn't influence the goal at all. But the thing is, as soon as you do things like that and it result and a goal comes, people will then accuse the protesters of being the cause of the goal. And it's just like we're defending a corner after sort of 17 minutes at home. Just at some point, we might have a corner when Millwall are defending. Why not do it then? It's still a protest. It still halts the game. It's just not when we're defending a corner. And I know we should have done better with the corner. It's still shit. You watch it and it's shit. We conceded a really soft goal. It's just don't put those extra obstacles in our way. And then we went on second half. They punted the ball long. Nathan Clark decided that he didn't like being stood next to his defensive partner. He wanted to 
be on the halfway line and then ran straight past the ball because he was never going to win it anyway. But if it had stood still, it would have come to him. And they jinked round. Libero saved a shot and the guy was a yard out and scored. And then we whimpered to a defeat. I can't remember. I mean, Neil could, could correct me. I can't remember anyone. I, I don't think anyone was man of the match because we discussed on the way out and no one shone. I mean, no one was above a five. And I can't remember us having a chance worthy of the name. Maybe we did. I can't really remember. But it was another one of those, we're shit. It's a league game. We're now losing quite easily. We're not scoring goals. No one's really shining. How the hell are we going to beat Wickham on Tuesday? Um, that, and that, I guess, is ultimately the first question of this, is how on earth did we beat Wickham then? Because it's been abject, and it's been the same level of abject now for weeks and weeks and weeks and weeks, if not months. But, the Neil, what exactly was the difference? Well, I, I guess it's the word you use there about level, and it's kind of the levels of application that we, we've shown in those previous games where, like Paul said, it's it's easy for teams to beat us because we're just so down and so lacking in any sort of um, enthusiasm or confidence for, for in ourselves. We just don't have the performances needed to sort of win the games, or at least win the games through our own volition. Wickham, it, it, to me, that showed sort of what can happen when there's kind of a, a clear goal at the end of what you're trying to do. So they, there's, it's very obvious at the end of that game, if they won that game, they had something that they were fighting for. And it, it, there was enough, it wasn't in the future. There wasn't anything like four months down the line in terms of, obviously the game is four months down the line, two months down the line, but it was not like, I've got loads more times to fix this. It was, if we mess this up, we won't go to Wembley. And I just felt like it was just pure application. It was genuine hard work and fighting for the ball and players you don't necessarily sort of um, connect with being that sort of player like Jordan Turnbull he's kind of a he's got a cool haircut and he's kind of a a tall guy but he's not the most sort of bustling of defenders he he stood up last night and he was he realised that it was his job to marshal that defence and he did it brilliantly I thought he he put in a fantastic performance and it kind of just epitomised the sort of level of attitude that everybody else showed on the pitch so while we may not have the quality and there was sort of it was like mistake ridden throughout the entire team and there were players just passing the ball where they should be passing it kind of last night wasn't really about that by the time we got to 2-0 up and I'll get to that in a minute it was kind of we, we went 2-0 up and then our mindset changed to it was very much right how do we make sure we win this game and there was a period of panic in the, in the first bit of the second half where we conceded Akin Fenwa came on and they just had no idea who he was or what they, what they, how they could deal with him. But then they kind of, in the weirdest sort of way, settled themselves. So it was still manic, but they kind of reveled in being manic and they were just flying into the tackles. They were smashing the ball away when they needed to. And it wasn't pretty, but what they did was they worked for the result. And I was saying to Paul before we came on, like, I have a concern now. Is, and that's kind of it will go one of two ways. You either now got a bunch of players who realise they have got what it, what it takes to win. They know that they've got to put in a load of effort, and they've got some maybe garnered some confidence from that win, and they can take that that sort of level of effort through to the next game. Or we'll have a situation like we had where last season, where they kind of feel like they've achieved something before they've achieved anything, mm. and there's no motivation beyond this point for them to do anything. And if they've already accepted that they're down but they're kind of just waiting for Wembley, that's a concern for me. But if they see it as we're fighting for places for Wembley, plus I now think I'm quite a good player. So people like George Thomas, who had a good game last night and was doing things that he doesn't normally do, like take people on. If they do that, they're good players. or They're better players than they've been showing. So that's kind of what I want from them. And that's how they won. They won from giving it a bloody good go and some good goals. You can't get get away from the fact that um, the first goal, it was good work down the right hand side. That was down, again through sort of hard work. Although I must say I I couldn't see because stupid sky cameras, the bloody one right in front of me. I didn't pick my seats thinking that we we're going ever going to be on telly this season. And I turned to the right and what have I got? A massive sky camera in the really? so I missed uh, basically a corner of the pitch. Um, I couldn't see any of, and that's where all the action happened before oh. that goal. But I'm guessing. Someone did okay to get the ball. Someone did okay to pass it into the middle. 
And then I saw Bevan um, swivel and turn and put it in the net. And then, as Paul's already said, Reed's pass was not the only good thing he did because he did do other good things. The only problem is the bad things are so comically bad, you kind of forget anything good that he does. <laughs> and obviously, very keen for George Thomas to get that goal. Dunno, that's me done. What do you make of Thomas overall? You suggested that it was a better performance. Yeah, and it's it's kind of the point I've been making about him all along. And now I don't think he's as fantastic a player as been made out by the I'm sure he's good in training, I'm sure mm. he's been good in the youth team. I, I don't think he's got from what I've seen anyway, the requisite act- attributes to be this stunning player that people will be made him out to be. But I think he can be a lot better than he has been. And last night, you got that spark of him realising actually there was, there was a bit more to him than he'd maybe been showing. So in previous games, he does what I kind of reference as Robert Betts um, football, which is do not make a mistake. Try and control it. Pass the book almost and not do anything else with it. Last night, I don't know whether it's because we were playing League Two and that like had a psychological effect where he felt like he was he was maybe better than the players he was playing against, but he, he was he was taking people on and he he was moving the ball past people. He, he's still a little bit um, scared, I'd say. I don't mm. think he, he gets into into sort of physical contact with players as he much as he should do. But I think as far as him moving on in his career and kind of believing he's he's as good as he, he should be. That was a good step for him last night. He got himself a goal. It, what turned out to be the winner, which psychologically yeah. the end is going to be huge for him. And also, he, he was just competing in a far more meaningful way on the pitch and actually taking people on, which for a winger is crucial. We, we can't have a winger who doesn't take anybody on. It's, it's just point, there's no point to that person. I'm just not sure I can see him as a winger. But then saying that, it's very difficult to pin down exactly what sort of player he is, isn't it? He's going to struggle because, it, like I say, I don't think he's got... If you the sort of the attributes to kind of put him in any position. So with Armstrong, you could play him on the wing or from uh, because of that lethal pace, he, yeah. he was suited to the wing. But like you say, um, Thomas isn't really suited to the wing. But for the sake of this formation, he's he's having to play there, so he's going to have to find a way to do it. At the same time, I mean, naturally you'd say you'd you'd want him up front, but has he got the lightning pace to do anything? I don't really know. He's He's not as much of a menace as someone like Bevan, although I think that's someone who he needs to model his game on. And I think if he can learn to become more sort of imposing, or for someone quite small, but just sort of get involved in the tougher side of the game a bit and just throw himself a, around a bit. And if that means making a few fouls, and even if it's daft, so be it. Just to show that he's he's happy to be involved in that side of the game because I, I do see him flinch quite a bit. And he needs he needs to kind of realise that that, that he, he can't get away with that. Um, I think that's the seventh start now for Stuart Bevan. Correct me if I'm wrong, anyone. Um, thoughts on him? It's it's just a shame that he doesn't finish the matches. It's ridiculous. He 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 did a kind of a Bolton performance where he was he was. Oh. I think I've said menace three times today, but that's what he was. <laughs> he was he, he was really he made it difficult for them. Even the headers that he was never going to win, he at least competed for them, which was very different to people who he had early on in the season. Um, I forgot who's that striker who I hated, who nobody could pronounce his name. Uh, Agui. Agui. There we go. Yeah, he, he was doing more than he would ever do. Um, he was just getting involved and putting himself about. Chasing things down, and he's got this knack of getting his foot in the in, like onto the ball and just kind of stunning it. So when it's going down the channel, it just kind of stretches leg out, stops the ball in its track, and at least we've then got possession. I don't really know what's going on if, if it's fitness or if it's just him constantly tweaking it, things. It's what his happened? hamstring. His hamstring. Is it, is it the same thing again? Yeah, it's his hamstring isn't particularly hundred percent. I mean, the other thing which is a big difference from yesterday to what we've been used to is. And I don't think it's any coincidence is we had Kean Harris and Jordan Turnbull at the back. And I think most people who were seeing the other games that um, Bevan's been involved in, his best one was probably Bolton at home, which again had um, T- Turnbull involved. And it's that distribution from the back which is critical for players like Bevan because he's not going to win anything in the air. Lumping it aimlessly forward isn't helping him at all because it's not his game, especially when we don't have a target man alongside him. One thing that um, John Tur- Tur- Turnbull and 
Keen Harris did yesterday a lot was they played still quite long ba- passes, but they were on the floor or they were chest yeah. height. Something to work so, with. Yeah, and also what we did more than we've done for ages yesterday is we used the channels really intelligently. We didn't. We, there was a spell in the second half after Bevan had gone off where I think we just panicked for 10 minutes where we just started going back, just route, in, route one in it and losing every, every ball in the air. But in the first half, there was definitely more of a concerted plan to, to try and bring him into play by not just isolating him with these ridiculous long balls. And that comes from having centre-backs who aren't just cloggers. And, I mean, you know, hands up, I've not been Jordan, Jordan Turnbull's biggest fan. I can't even say his name this evening. <laughs> but the second half, he was magnificent. He was absolutely brilliant. He made one slight error and then did a fantastic it recovering tackle and you were like you stood there just went that's what people must have seen in him because for the first time he was a he won everything in the air or if he didn't win it he just made sure the opposing player didn't win it easily he just had a really good solid solid second half and you just thought well where where has that performance been coming from but I think and I said this to Neil um, before the pod I think there's also we scored with our first two chances, and I'm not taking anything away from. And they were the, probably the best two chances we've created in about four games. They were just really good chances. But, um, Callum Riley did really well for the first goal. Bevan's touch is amazing to sort of create the time and space for him to turn and shoot. And as we said, Carl Reed's ball and then George Thomas's touch and then composure to finish because Wickham had an easier chance themselves in the first half from a similar ball over the top where their guy just ballooned it over the bar because the guy had time to take a touch and try to hit it first time. At least, you know, Thomas had the instinct to, to control his emotions and to be calm enough to select the right choice in that situation. And once we were tuned it up, that gave us such a boost. And yeah, the, like the second half was scrappy at times and backs against the wall, but We'd given ourselves that opportunity. And that's, I suppose, the worry going into the Oldham game is if we don't score first or we don't score our first couple of chances, how are we going to, how are we going to take? But I think we also need to, we need to, we need to learn from what we've watched yesterday. Ryan Haynes is a damn fine footballer. Yes. But not only that, he's developing more and more. Yesterday he made three fantastic interceptions where he covered his centre half from crosses in from the, from the left, you, you covered his centre half and got in front of his player, and it's like that's what we've been talking about. No one's ever said that he's the finished article, but without games, you don't learn what your role is, what how players react around you, and with with games, he's looking more and more assured, and he has this knack of ghosting past players, which is just something you can't teach. He, he, he can just beat players with with ease, and that really helped second half and then on the other side you had Kelly Evans and I think this helps George Thomas because when we played other fullbacks who are a bit more defensive which the other three fullbacks we've had this season are your right midfielder can get a bit isolated because Dion Kelly Evans is basically like the Duracell bunny who just runs up and down for 90 minutes at least Thomas knows that he's got an outlet he's, he's always got an easy ball, but he's also got someone he can play off. He can, he can knock and run. He, there's, there's interaction there. So, I mean, I know, I know for a fact that the back four on Saturday will be Foley back at right back, Nathan Clark, and um, whatever Fred his name, Rawson, Frown, yeah. Rawson, or whatever his name is, because that's what that's what Slade would do. But if he was a bold manager, he would keep Kelly Evans in at least out of those three because. Just in this division, you, you're not up against Ryan Giggs. You're not up against Gareth Bale. You're up against people like Kyle Reid, who are really hit and miss. You can afford to have a defender who's not 100% there defensively, but gives you something else. And that's one thing. Kelly Evans, he gives us something else. He gives us momentum. He gives us someone to use on the right who's going to bring us forward. And then the other person I think deserves a lot of praise is... Um, Jack Finch, when he came on, who settled into the role of basically being stood in front of um, a Fenway, and basically he just did everything right. He did, he came into a specific job, and he did it for half an hour. And sometimes 
you know, you can basically play 90 minutes. If you don't kick the ball once, you can still have a good game or you, you can still influence the game in a positive way. And that's, that's basically what he did. I'll tell you what, I just want to get it on record that I loved Kelly Evans's performance. I thought he, he that's a perfect example of using everything you've got available to you to the best of your ability. So, OK, he's not tall, but he got as much height as he possibly could on his jumps. He won so many headers because he wanted the ball more. And it, it was just... He was doing everything that you want from your right back. He was, he was like a, a terrier against their player. And he, he's actually a really good footballer as well. He, he's not panicked in possession, which you could kind of forgive someone that, that sort of young in that atmosphere. You, you could forgive him for being panicked. But he just, I, I had no sort of issues with him at all. I didn't feel like worried about him being in that position or worried about him messing up or anything like I kind of was when he first came into the team. And I think that was more sort of sizeism than anything else. I just found the fact, oh, he can't impact the match. But turns out he really can. And yeah, I'm with you. I think you can't drop someone for that performance. It just doesn't send out the right message at all where you've got someone coming in playing that well. And there's there's no good reason to not have him in the team on Saturday. There just isn't. I'm not having tiredness or anything because they just played 90 minutes. It's fine. They're footballers. 90 minutes on Tuesday, a few days rest, smack in between. It's fine. Yeah, and he's not featured an enormous amount recently, is he? It's exactly. not like he's played... There's Tuesday. no reason. It's not like he's doing Tuesday, Saturday, week in, week out. Actually, mm. he's kind of... He's been in and out. Here's a question for you, Neil. If he was three inches taller, <laughs> how many more games would he have played this season? With the exact same, you know, capability and everything. Because I think... Fifteen. You are, I know, well, yeah, the magic number, of course. I He... But I guess, you know, the point that I'm making is that I just don't think I've seen him play anything other than fine ever since he's been here. And I'm just surprised, really, that he's not had more of a look in. And I wonder how much of it is his height. And that, that I makes think him... it might do, because we're always looking for these, you know, we've always been looking for these tall defenders, haven't we? Just dominating. And it's always been the, the, the sort of theme of the post-mass interviews when we've kind of, you've had Venus talking about how we've, we're not strong enough. And he's kind of the epitome of, technically not being strong enough but I didn't see any of that last night and uh, yeah so I, I I think the point is he, he if he was taller if he was bigger he would have played more games and I think what he needs now is bravery from a manager to recognise good players when they're there and competent players when they're there and actually what I think at this moment in time is really crucial players who really genuinely care and you know those matches mean something to him yeah, you can absolutely. see his, his reaction at the end of the game where and I'm not saying nobody else didn't because it's they all were really happy, but you you spot him a mile off the re- reaction of a Coventry fan who's just taken his team to Wembley, an 18 year old lad, 19 year old lad, wherever it is, it it just stands out a mile, and he, I've just I'm really really pleased for him. I think that's how the, I felt about George Thomas as well. I I can't quite place it, but I really want him to come good and sort of you know. And really perform. I feel very much the same with um, with the, both of the Kelly Evanses, but specifically with Dion, I guess, because we've seen him much, much more. Um, and the, I, the, the crucial point that I think you make is around, at the moment, I think we probably need to be placing an emphasis at, at a time where the quality level amongst the squad is lower than what we'd want it to be on things like, and you know, I, uh, on passion and determination and drive and energy and he gives you that unquestionably doesn't he definitely and uh, sorry just want to fit in here just because the things the, the games when we played well recently have actually stemmed around those qualities from in those matches where we've shown more more drive towards so the Bolton game where while we didn't win it there was a completely different sort of atmosphere and, and attitude from the players and the same again here so I don't the quality doesn't seem to go up or down in these matches so it can be quite sort of neutral and even last night we there was periods when we were really quite poor but it's it's that level and if that's going to be the difference between us winning some games before now and the end of the season and not I think you need to throw your cards at it and say look this is this is what we're going to go for because if that's the only difference between us being the team that we've been losing losing and then the team that's going to get us a few more points you go with the points every time. Sorry, Paul. Well, isn't it also the the reality of the situation is we've got 18 games between now and the end of the season, 17 in the league, and the likelihood is we'll get relegated. However, even if we don't get relegated, I don't think survival or relegation will 
be based on who we play at right back. So the other option, the other thing you got to look at is where would we be better as a club for Kelly Evans to play 17 games or for Foley to play 17? Yeah. One of them's what 19, 20. The other one's 33. It's not even a, a 50, 50 choice. It's not even like our oh, Foley's experience, and we need. If it was, if we were close, like we were a, a point off, and you were thinking, "Wow, you know that experience," we're eight points adrift, and the Oldham game, if we lose against Oldham, will be eleven points adrift, which is four wins, which is basically all we've won in the league this season. So, there's no nothing to gain by not playing Kelly Evans because if he isn't good enough. You've got 17 games to go, OK, the lad isn't good enough. I need to bring someone in and someone to play right back. If he is good enough, then your next season, he's our right back for the whole season. You Basically, you've killed one of the positions for next yeah. season. And it's, for me, it's, it's very simple. Just give him the games. We ha- we're not going to gain anything out of Foley playing right back now. What if you've got five wins out of Foley playing at right back? Right back, I, right back. But I, 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 I don't think... Foley is the player who's going to be the difference between us winning and losing five games. Bear in mind, I do agree with you on this point. It's just I don't, I, I, I don't sacrifice the potential to get out of the situation just to keep someone in for the sake of keeping them in. That's the one thing I would say. If he's not, if it's not working in say three, four games time, and it's, it's clearly not working, and we need to make a change. I, I, I don't know. Maybe that I feel a lot of the time that this is just me, but. I, I, I'm not playing if if it's costing us games and it's clearly costing us games. I'm not sticking with him, regardless of who it is. That that that's fine. But if if it was a choice between playing a 33 year old like Roland Nielsen and Kelly Evans, then it's a different argument. What we're talking about here is an average player who's passed it against a player we're unsure about who who is is basically untried. And for me, from what I've seen. I don't think there's... If, if Foley had come in and been absolutely awesome, he'd be like, hands up, you know, this, this guy's got to play. And it's a bit the same with Nathan Clark. If he'd have come in and been absolutely brilliant, he'd be like, oh, OK, Nathan Clark has to come back into the team on Saturday. He'll come back into the team because Russell Slade will bring him back into the team. Whether or not he deserves to come back into the team after the performance he had on Saturday and the performance that the two centre-halves had yesterday... Is, com- is, a, is a different argument because, as I said, I'm, people know who listen to this, I'm not Jordan Turnbull's biggest fan. But dropping him after Tuesday's performance again sends out the wrong message because he was brilliant in the second half. And if you're asking your players to, to do something to set a standard for themselves, he's now set a standard. And you talk about this a lot, Neil. It's like, he's set a standard now. I want to see if he can replicate that against Oldham away. I, I don't think it's fair on him he could have made the changes he made because I know he made them because there were players with um, cup tied. But he could have made them legitimately from a tactical point of view because Nathan Clark was shit on Saturday. He was dreadful, truly dreadful. Like you could pin both goals at his door, bad. So he could have been dropped legitimately because he's out. He's not playing well. So I think Jordan Turnbull, out of the two performances, is the player who's in is in charge of that shirt. He deserves to get the next chance. And yeah. it's going to be a shame that he's not going to do it. He, he, I could be completely wrong, but I just get the feeling that we'll go back to the team that lost against Millwall instead of embracing the team that beat Wickham. And I know it's a difference because Wickham are a lower league team and all that other jazz. But at the end of the day, that's the team with momentum. And those players are the players who've got us to Wembley in that trophy. I mean, it's, it was amazing that we'd, every time we played in the Checker Trade Trophy, Ryan Haynes would play. We'd, he'd yep. either play one score or he'd play well. And the next league game, he'd be dropped and we'd lose again. And he were like, well, how? It, this is, you know, you're not it's, sending up. The, it's not fair to it's quote an my, imperfect, my four-year-old daughter. It's, it's like an imperfect understanding of how you win football matches. And I'm not saying there's a definitive, but I always go back to some of the teams like, it, it's not always logical. Like the Liverpool team with Jamie Carragher left back, that is not logical. And yet they developed a team and a unit which just worked for them. And it's kind of the same with us almost at the moment, where we've, whether it was by luck, by judgment, or whatever, we stumbled across for one game only, admittedly, a team that actually gave our gave a shit. 
Now, changing that for the next match, based on sort of other reasons, so like height and like age and things like that, maybe that unit doesn't work, just does, doesn't work. And we've kind of seen that in the games that we had before. It just doesn't work. They're not playing together. Players have come into the team, like um, Nathan Clark, who's just not playing very well. So what if they're taller? Maybe that doesn't help the unit as a whole. And it's, it's, it's just this odd understanding of how to win football matches, which I never quite get, where we always feel the old adage about not changing the winning team. When you're in our position and when winning wins come so infrequently and confidence is so low, I think you embrace those things more than anything else. You embrace the players on the pitch who've just won you a game and feel like they're on top of the world. Don't do what we did to like Ryan Haynes in the early in the season when he played well, whenever he had the opportunity to play well. And then we just keep getting dropped. How does that help anybody? And that also doesn't help the player coming in this place because they kind of know, well, I can play as shit as I like and I'm still going to come back in regardless. Um, any more that we want to wrap up on either Wickham or Millwall? Hmm. No, it's just very pleasant. <laughs> it's just quite nice to know that we're, yeah, going to Wembley. I know, I said, we know the Checker Trade Trophy isn't the world's greatest competition. And I know a lot of fans from other clubs will be looking down and going, ah, they're going to Wembley. But it's only, at the end of the day, we're in the only trophy that we could really get to the final of. Yeah. And we've got And there. we've done it, yeah. And at the end of the day, we, it's just going to be nice to have 40,000 Cov fans united behind the team, even if it's for one game. It just makes such a change. And it's something we, you've got to, you know, this is why we support a football club for exactly. these moments. Yeah. It's sort of, for last, for, for last night, just as I said, for when we scored, the atmosphere is why you go to football. It's jumping on top of strange people. It's, <laughs> that, but it's basically 11,000 people feeling the same emotion at once. And for once, that emotion isn't, Ugh. Mm. And when that second goal went in and the realisation, I said to Neil, my other moment of the week was that the atmosphere was really good. And then after we were turning up, I swear, it was about the 35th minute or something like that. The atmosphere died for like a minute. Because I think everyone was just looking at the mic going, <laughs> are we actually 2 nil up? Are we yeah. doing this? Is this actually happening? Are we going to Wembley? And then it was like, I think we are. And then the atmosphere built again. But it was really funny how there was just this lull of, oh my life, we're going to Wembley. <laughs> and then it, it built up again. And the second half, I think, because Wickham basically threw everything at us, that kept them... It's sometimes the, having a tense game, having that sort of, yeah. oh my God, just keep everyone... Not, just on edge, but keeps the atmosphere going because, you know, obviously if we'd won 4-0, that would have been great and everyone could have gone Ole. But because it was like 2-1 and you were so, you were just still involved in the game and it's like my nephew Sherwin, he's 18, bless him. He was like, that's the worst eight minutes of my entire life. <laughs> like, well. But it, you just, you can't, you, you, it's really odd being a football fan in those circumstances because you've got no influence on what's happening in front of you. But it's the only thing for those that minute or those minutes which actually matters. But you're you are just this sort of inanimate object on the side who can't influence the players. You can't you know you can't kick it for them. You can't bollock them for doing something. You just can't you physically can't do anything. But it just means so much. And the outpouring of relief when the final whistle went and you know that's that's why we go. You know, especially us who have been through. You know, we've won four league games this season. In the last calendar year, we've probably only won about six. We're a dreadful football side. It's not fun to watch us play. But yesterday was sort of... I don't know how what it makes up for, but it definitely makes up for something. It might not make up for the fact we're going to be a fourth-tier team next season, but it definitely makes up for some of the shit we've had to endure. Yeah, I just... I, it's, I think... We it, it's just great, isn't it? They, that's why I'm struggling for words. It's not more complex than just. Uh, it's yeah. a really, really good thing, and I'm just I'm very, very much looking forward to it. Uh, I wanted to pick up on two final things before we finish up. Firstly, we have made it to 40 minutes without discussing the potential signing of 34-year-old Yakubu. Yeah, the reason for that. <laughs> you younger than I thought. You are. 
He's younger than I thought. Yeah, he's probably a lot younger than <laughs> his passport says as well. <laughs> um, I was setting someone up. I, don't know. I, uh, <laughs> I also <laughs> like the fact that the BBC website um, says Coventry way up Yakubu signing. And I realised, <laughs> I also realised that you could just knock off the word signing and that's, that situation would be exactly the same. <laughs> that basically. Oh, the, th- the thing about him is, he, if. If you created a chance, he would score. Yeah. I mean, that, he spent his entire career basically being lethal within the 18-yard 18, yeah. 18 box. The problem is, as I said, we scored two good goals yesterday. Those were the first two decent chances we created in about five games. So, you're going to... Unless there's someone alongside him who's going to present chances for him... And all those people who are making the comparison to um, Akin Fenway, I think... He's just a completely different animal, yeah, he's, really, yeah. in what he does. Yeah, it's not the same. The, what will be interesting? So, what I don't, I have a feeling that he's not going to be able to prove his fitness because he's Yakubu. Um, and but the, I, the, I have a slight feeling that sometimes a player like Bevan is strange, isn't he? Because he's not a goal scorer and he's not a target man, but evidently he is a link-up man of some description. And actually, maybe it's difficult to... Cre- it's one of them sort of chicken and egg situations. Is it that we don't score because we don't create chances, or do we not create chances because we've got no players who are able to score? Does that make sense? You wonder yeah, whether if you that. did have an assassin in the box, whether all of a sudden Bevan would be able to provide opportunities for him. And to your point earlier, Paul, around the distribution from the back, actually, if you give... Do you know what I mean? If you start... The problem is, if you start thinking about these things ever so slightly more logical than kick it long up to no one, then you might start to get some goals. But the, and the second point... Oh, uh, sorry, go on. Well, oh, yeah. yeah, you keep going. No, 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 that's, that's, that's fine. Um, you go. Yeah, well, that's pretty much my, my point. This is kind of... We, we spoke about Ryan Kent last season about where he wasn't doing much with it, but he was still occupying players and yeah. drawing them away, making space for others. It's kind of the similar sort of thing where suddenly you go to a, a team in League One and they see Yakubu. Now, he might not be any good, but they see Yakubu. And they maybe start to pay a bit more attention to him than they would do George Thomas, which leaves it leaves gaps. Exactly. Because these aren't, these aren't fantastic defenders. These are League One defenders and they're, they're prone to, you know, human mistakes. And that's it. That's kind of... That's why I, I would take him... For the sole reason that we need like a, another genuine option, because I can't handle another game looking at the bench and seeing Jody Jones as our striking option. That's that's not going to work for me. And also, for that other reason, just having someone on the pitch who's going to make the opposition think. Because when you just got two guy up front by himself, they don't think about that. They're not worried. It's not the same beast, is it? It's it's a completely different level. I mean, two guy had a really good game yesterday. But he, he's still no. He's, he, he had a really good game when we were two 0 up, and basically he just he had to run around and make life difficult for the opposition. That's it. He did that well, didn't he? Yeah, yeah. he did that really well. But he still isn't. He's, I think he's gone three three league goals this season. Yeah. He could probably end up with three league goals this season. But that's the strange thing with strikers, more so than any other position, is it's possible to be more types of striker than it is really for to be anything else and that you can't the, it's, when we're saying that it's you know that Tud guy isn't the right guy it's not necessarily a criticism of his overall ability albeit that I think that possibly is questionable he's just <laughs> he, but, he, but what we need at the moment is just an out and out goal scorer and he's palpably not that and Bevan is not that at all either is he so I don't think it's, it could be inferred that we're having a go at either of them, but we just need somebody who is a goal scorer. And Yakubu is, I mean, it is crazy to be talking about it, isn't it? Because he's 40 years old and, I mean, like the size of a house, I imagine. <laughs> the... Apparently he's not that big. Apparently he's just unfit, which there are, there is sort of obviously, you can be unfit but not fat. Yeah, From I what know, I understand, yeah, I he isn't. He isn't as fat as you'd imagine, but he is clearly, <laughs> clearly unfit. And yeah. that's the, the, sort of almost the crux of it is we saw this last season. Can you play, can you bring in a player who's basically been retired for six months and get them up to speed? I, I'm not sure. I, 
the Kubu is a funny one anyway because I just, oh, he's aged thing. But also, he is someone who, if the ball goes into the box, I would trust to score. Yeah, still, yeah. In that but, same way that you think that Ian Wright would probably still get you a few goals at this point. Yeah. Or, or, or Les Ferdinand. Or, yeah. You know, Dion Dublin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's like, where do you go? No, Romario would probably bag yeah. uh, three or four between now and the end of the season. Cause, <laughs> but it's basically... I would sign Romario. I think that's a really good shout. Let's have a win. <laughs> yeah. But basically, all you're doing is waiting. You're hoping the ball drops them in the box on their right, correct foot and they can score. But you're then basically playing with... 10 men for the rest of the game because you're anticipating they're not going to do anything. I mean, Yakubu was never very good at link-up play, even in his prime. It wasn't his. No. And that's why I mean he's completely different from Akin Fenway. He, he, most of Akin Fenway's game is basically being the player you build from. The thing about um, Akin Fenway, he is as fat as you imagine. Yeah. He's, it's very different. He's not a footballer. He, yeah, I mean... I think the, the Kelly Evans twins didn't swap a shirt with him. They just swapped both of their <laughs> pair of shorts for one of his. And then they just waddled around the dressing room, <laughs> one in each leg. Did anyone check that it wasn't them two stood on each other's shoulders when he came <laughs> on? Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up um, was... Now, this is a favourite of yours, Paul, and I'm usually the one to moan about it. But I'm uh, officially bestowing... Big game status on Saturday. I would say, <gasps> yeah, I'm, I think it's what's it. I think it's it officially game, qua- yeah. it officially qualifies. We've got a game in with they've got twenty eight points. Oh, we've got Oldham away for those of you who don't know. Oldham away. They've got they've got, got twenty nine, haven't they? No, they eight got, points out of us. No, they the so it's they've no, got so because um, Swindon have got twenty nine then. Yeah, that's right. So they're the team that are outside of the relegation places because we're eight yeah. points in the mind. But we've got a game in hand on Oldham and as uh, improbable as it is, a win does kind of make you think... I, I can't, back in. Well, I do kind of feel like... When you were talking earlier, Neil, about um, when you two were talking about Foley and whatever and you'd said, in you know, if in five games' time... Uh, Kelly Evans hasn't proved to be successful and you can consider bringing Foley back in because you don't want to write off relegation. I actually think that if we don't win three of the next five games, we are down, aren't we? I, I think that, we've yeah, got to do, we've got to do it now down, anyway. Yeah. So, but the, yeah. I understood the point that you were making, but I just thought it was an interesting sort of museum. But the, yeah, I think we have to start... There can be no question. We have to beat... Which we've all been horrendous at in previous relegation seasons. We need to beat the teams around us when those opportunities are presented to us now, don't we? And that has to start on Saturday, just absolutely has to. And especially having won the game and going to Wembley and blah, 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 blah they need to use this opportunity as a, as a sort of crest of a wave and go there with some definitely, confidence definitely. and say... We need, to do, we need to do everything that we possibly can to get that win. So we do the thing, so we, we keep the winning team, we play the players who are playing well. Yeah. As fans, we... Dare I say it, we don't disrupt the match. Not this game. I know people love doing it, but I just feel like at the moment the merit doesn't outweigh sort of the negatives. Well, it's just, it's kind of, it's distracting from what we're trying to do on the pitch. And even if there's a a slight risk or potential risk of it causing disruption and actually impacting the players, and we don't know if that's true or not, but what I'm saying is if there's even the slightest risk of it, let's not bother with it. Not not at the moment. Let's see what happens. If, If we go down... And with like 10 games to spare, there's enough to play for. Oh, Jesus Christ, you can do what you like, I guess. But right now, while we're fighting for our lives, I just feel like we, we need to do everything within our power to stop whatever what seems to be the inevitable happening. And the other reality is, normally to survive in this division, you need to get around 50, 52 points. With 30 points off that, so that's 10 wins. And Yikes. we don't have... 10 home games left so we're going to have to win at least one if not two away games mm-hmm. all and I'd say is that they just match so. every season every season we make these sums and we're always 5-10 off what the, the ultimate points target is and we end up oh, yeah. but I mean it's, if, if we can't beat Oldham on Saturday and let's face it since John Sheridan's gone back to Oldham they've they've picked up points I mean they have yeah, won a couple of games recently they're, they're, not, their they're, they're not the team they were previously John Sheridan's done this a couple of times at Oldham where he's gone in and got basically brought in similar players 
you know, brought in Anthony Gerrard again, who had at the end of the last season. They brought in some players, and he gets some play. You no, know, he gets things out of Oldham, which is always baffles me why he then leaves because he comes <laughs> back like a year later to bail them out of the shit. So I just <laughs> cautious about Oldham. I ask me, I'll take a draw now just to start building some momentum. I just, I, but, we, I just don't think we can afford it, can we? We, I, I, no, it, I know, it, that's, it, that's it, reality. It, yeah. it really, it absolutely has to be a win on Saturday. Otherwise, I think, well, you know, we're never down, down until it's mathematically certain. Yeah, oh, yeah, it's but dicey, you, obviously. But, you'd, but you'd be very, <laughs> but, very struggling to, to do anything from there. But it, it would be peak cov if the day before we went to the Checker Trade Trophy, I think that would be, there's five games... That would have been the fifth from final game, so there have been four games left. So the Sheffield United game would give us five games, because it's been moved, we'd have five games left. It will be peak Coventry to get relegated the Saturday before we go to the Checker Trade Trophy. <laughs> oh, yeah, I remember the last time we got relegated before the Checker Trade Trophy final. That was just so typical. <laughs> That's a dig. Yeah, I- <laughs> oh, no, sorry, Paul. I, up. No, I completely agree. I just feel like it's going to. Tr- so if something's going to conspire to ruin our day, ruin our day, bleh, ruin our day, and it's going to be us. That's what I mean. That's we, we'll be the only club who could, before we go to a final, already be depressed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. If it can um, happen. Yeah, we'll get relegated the week before and then we'll get absolutely spanked. Like, we'll concede two in the first five minutes and just get absolutely mauled in the final. <laughs> I, I, think, I, think, I, think, <laughs> I think we all agree that we want um, Luton in the final because Oxford are a League One side and we don't want to play League One side. We want right, to play League style. Two. That's yeah. it. <laughs> That's how we've got to the final. We've played League Two sides and then the 21s. Yeah. Who's got the most fans? Us. Is notoriously, uh, aside from us. <laughs> I would say Oxford. Mm, I think they're, they're pretty, pretty similar. I would yeah. say they're, they're Luton pretty similar. Size. I, um? I, seem, I seem to recall Luton being quite a diehard group of fans. Yeah, I feel yeah. like Luton might have a bigger pool to pick from, uh, even though Oxford has got to be a much bigger place. But it, Luton mm. feels very football-y, doesn't it, as opposed to Oxford, which I don't think is, isn't, is particularly, is it? Um, okay, any final thoughts? Shall we wrap up? Let's get out of here. Mm-hmm. Thank you for uh, thank you for listening. If you want to get in touch, it's uh, Neil Ampty Show at gmail dot com on the email or at Neil Ampty Show on Twitter. Um, and so, thank you, Paul. Cheers, buddy. Thank you, Neil. Bye. We go at Wembley. Bye. <laughs>